0.7 halogens. Basically, the word halogen means salt forming compounds. And we actually picked this word for this specific group, group seven, because uh, almost in all of the salts around the world, the majority comes into being because of halogens. They're the most reactive non-metals group. And if you take a look at the periodic table, this group would be the one to contain most non-metals and most reactive ones too. Now, the reactivity in contrast to group one actually decreases down the group. The group one was pretty opposite. The one at the bottom of the group was the most reactive one. For example, in group one, it started off with lithium, then we had sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and cesium was the most reactive one. On the other hand, if we talk about halogens, they start off with fluorine, fluorine, bromine, iodine, and acetin. So if you move to the top of the group, this is going to be the most reactive one. This difference is actually due to the fact that these are metals and these are non-metals, which, which make them completely opposite in their properties. Hence the difference between reactivity too. Moving on, we are going to go with some very basic observations about halogens, and those are a part which you need to memorize. For example, fluorine is dangerously reactive. It's a pale yellow in gas at room temperature. Fluorine is a little dense, but it's pale green and it's poisonous. Bromine is a deep red liquid. It has red brown vapors. It's also poisonous. Remember, bromine was the only liquid non metal at room temperature on the periodic table. Moving on, iodine is a gray solid which can easily sublime into purple vapors. Don't forget that this was the example we took for sublimation into purple vapors, and this is also poisonous. Whatever is written in the last two points for all three of parts of this diagram is not something that you're supposed to memorize. You don't need to memorize their masses. You don't need to memorize about their salts or kind of salts they have or their sources, right? So you can easily skip the last two points in every part of this diagram and just go with the first two. If you remember the colors, the colors for halogens have been a part of past papers very commonly and all three of them actually, two, four, and six. So make sure that you do not skip it. Any questions from this part? Okay. So acetin is again, highly radioactive and rare element. We don't even know about its properties completely. So we're not gonna discuss acetin among these. So when we're going to discuss halogens, we will always be discussing from fluorine all the way to iodine. Let's discuss the most common properties. They're all poisonous and they have very similar strong smells. They're all non-metals. They all can form diatomic molecules. Di means two. Atomic comes from atom, which means a molecule made up of two atoms like Cl2, Br2, I2, F2. They all have a valency or a combining power of one and the compounds have the similar formula, such as hydrogen chloride has the formula HCl. Take Cl out, add Br, it becomes hydrogen bromide. Take Br out, add I, it becomes hydrogen iodide. So you would see that their formula and their namings are pretty close or precise with one another. Moving next, the compounds with hydrogen are usually strongest since when dissolved in water. So either one of these, HCl, HBr, or HI, when dissolved in water, become strong acids, which are then known as hydrochloric acid, hydrobromic acid, and hydroiodic acid. Remember, these three are gases, but what they form when combining with something else, they don't remain gases anymore. I, I mean, dissolving them in water turn them into acids. Moving on, they each produce a series of compounds with other elements. If the elements are composed of Cl, they're known as chlorides, if B are bromides, if I, iodides. Together, we can call the entire group as halides. The halogens themselves can react directly with metals to form metal halides. Metal halides are something that we commonly call salts. 
And this is an important area where you understand something about salts, that salts would be made from metal, positive parts, and halides, the negative parts. How come halides are negative? That's given below. They can all form negative ions by easily carrying a single electron as a single charge. So fluorine becomes fluoride ions, bromine becomes bromide ions, and iodine becomes iodide ions. So you can see that their formula and their names are pretty close to one another and easier to remember. Make sense? Okay, moving on. The chemical reactivity of halogens. When we talk about the chemical reactivity of halogens, there are actually three kinds of reactions which we are supposed to do. So the first one is reaction with metals, and it actually gives us salts. The second one is reaction with hydrogen, and it actually gives us acid. And the third one is reaction with water. It gives us acid plus. Another acid or a bleaching agent. We're going to discuss both characteristics for this one. Okay, let's discuss these reactions one by one. So, when we talk about metals and salts, we understand that metal and a non metal are combining to form a salt. Remember, ionic compounds are made up of positive ions and negative ions. When chlorine passed off uh, overheated aluminum, the metal grows white and forms aluminum chloride. Aluminum chloride is AlCl3. Aluminum also reacts strongly with bromine and iodine. The reaction mixture between the dry powder of aluminum and iodine can be triggered by just adding a few drops of water. Now, this pretty much means that the metals can react with halogens to form salts. So let's not confuse our, ourselves with some different examples. Hydrogen will burn in chlorine to form hydrogen chloride. However, the reaction would be much slow if they are reacting with bromine or iodine. So this is the right way to write the reaction. In this case, hydrogen plus a halogen gives you an acid. Next up is chlorine reacting with water. All four halogens, I mean fluorine, Chlorine, bromine, iodine can dissolve, be dissolved into water and they would give acidic solutions every time. Let me clear this up. Now, as soon as they react with water, they are giving us two kinds of acids. You are probably already familiar with hydrochloric acid, HCl, but the other one is hypochlorous acid. You would find an oxygen atom attached to hydrochloric acid because of which we are calling it a hypochlorous acid. Now, hypochlorous acid can give up its oxygen to other substances, and this gives him the property to bleach. Because on colored substances, if you use the bleaching agent, they would lose their color when they, as they are oxidized. So this oxygen goes out. This produces a bleaching agent, hypochlorous acid, and an actual acid, hydrochloric acid. This reaction is used as a chemical test for chlorine gas. Don't forget, in multiple places in the book, he's going to test you chemical reactions for different parts. Whenever he tells you that, just underline that part, keep that part in the book, don't forget it, so that you can discuss this part later on. Now, let's connect it with the adapted or litmus paper or universal indicator paper working. If you use them, the paper is bleached when held in the gas, proving the working for this hypochlorous acid. But this working steadily becomes less reactive as you go down the group, which means chlorine can easily bleach this one as well as quickly. Bromine would take some time, less easy, and iodine would take most of the time because of making it most difficult for it to bleach. That's because in the group, chlorine is presented at the top in comparison to iodine, 
which is present at bottom. So this means that this is more reactive, of course, and this actually is less reactive, as we have said earlier. Now, in order to produce the more and less reactivity, we can easily give examples of displacement reactions. In displacement reactions, one of these components has to be in its actual state. The other one can be turned off. I mean, used in an aqua solution of its salt, and there would be a displacement. Let me show you with the help of the table on the next page. Just a second. This is the equation. We can pick this one too. Chlorine is in its normal form. Bromine. However, it's not present in bromine form, it's actually bromide salt, which is present in the form of solution, which is colorless. Now, as soon as chlorine would be able to react it, and it would react, as chlorine is more reactive, it would displace bromine and is converted into salt itself, and then bromine goes out in orange color. So the colorless is converted into orange, giving us the idea that displacement reaction has proceeded already. Now, this is not the only example, as I was telling you about the page next page and the table on the next page, you'll find other examples as well. Take a look. They have given chlorine, bromine, and iodine on top, and on sides, they are talking about chlorides, bromides, and iodide. So it is going to give you a pretty good idea here about something that if the group starts with F, C, L, P, R, and I, take a look that I will not be able to react with anything or displace anything. PR is capable of displacing iodine, so it displaces iodine. However, it's still incapable of displacing something from its stop. So bromine cannot displace fluorine or fluorine, but bromine can displace iodine. And there you go. Uh, that the reaction is changed. Bromine became a part of the solution. Iodine differently. Number one, chlorine. As chlorine is present on top of bromine and iodine, then you should understand it could bleach easily, react with iron very strongly. It won't produce anything with chlorine. It would produce uh, in displacement with bromine, simple bromine gas, and it can easily displace iodine as well. So that's how they are able to displace one another just because of being more reactive. We good? All right. So there are some equations written over here. Cl2. 2Ki gives us 2KCl plus I2. This is the diagram to give us how the orange brown color of bromine shows in potassium bromide or in other substances. Okay. Any questions from halogens? Because this just completes halogens for us. All right, let's then come to noble gases or group eight or group zero. Let me tell you, there is a lot of information in this portion which you may not require at all. So I'm just going to go with a couple of important things. First, this is group eight because it consists of eight electrons in its outermost shell. And this group is placed at the very right end because there are the elements in it, which are least reactive with the other ones. There is, are a couple of pieces of information that we might need to know. One man was involved in the isolation of all of these elements in the group. This make about, about 1% of the Earth's environment. Argon is the most common gas. We call them noble gases because they do not even react at all or react too less. Then comes the uses of noble gases. This has been a part of past paper. This are, is the kind of question that they still might ask. So helium is used in airships and balloons because it's light and unreactive. 
Organ is used to fill light bulbs because it will not react with the filament even at high temperatures. Noble gas is used in neon lights when we pass electricity through noble gases, they actually turn red. Example of which is shown at the bottom of this page in the form of diagram. And we may put, apart from neon, we may put other gases in the electrical discharge systems or the tubes that we have containing a little amount of noble gas. Different gases give different colors. However, we had just discussed the color of noble gases. Moving on, it's this paragraph that we need to understand and memorize. The electron arrangement of atoms uh, of the noble gases are very stable. This means they do not react readily with any other atom, and that's true. The entire set of noble gases uh, atoms have less than 20 compounds in total. So that's a big count, but they don't have enough compounds. Up next, they do not react readily with other atoms. In many situations where atoms of other elements bond or react chemically, they are trying to achieve that stable configuration of electrons because of which you can put extra electrons in the extra structure, but not more than that. How to fill electron arrangement? I've already discussed that at the end of chapter two. So now we know if we're going to correlate it, group number will show you the number of valence cell electrons and period number will show you the number of shells. Right. Trends across a period. This is a small topic in this book, but I think I've already explained how the atomic size decreases from bottom to top in a group or from left to right in a period. If you understand that, fine. If not, please let me know so that I can explain it again.